place, the more we find people want to learn how to do stuff easier. So uh, that's what our purpose in that is. And I say I would welcome our, our, we used to try and fit 30 people into just this room until we put that door in and got an extra room. So we're sort of used to being dense and concentrated and stuff. And uh, any questions on the general sense of it? And then if not, you can all start us off. And we are going to be sharing uh, both slide decks and code and stuff like that through uh, Git repos that we work in. That's how we share everything as we're doing things. We basically do a lot of open source software development in our group. So we tend to do want to write code, which everyone can read and see and work on cloud with you. Make sense? Any questions? So then we'll see. Okay. Uh, so my name's Ethan Pickering. Um, I'm a master's student, hopefully finishing up at the end of this month with my master's defense, so we'll see. Still got to write it. Um, so, uh, so I'll be going through most of today's um, stuff, actually probably all of today's stuff. Um, we're just going to do a brief overview of the different things that we're going to be using, at least in the beginning of this, and the different things you need to install and find and go figure out how to use on your computer real quick before we can really get started. Um, so I'm going to jump over to this, which I'm calling the Tea Time Starter Pack. Um, so the four things that we'll really need uh, is R and R Studio, um, which is the, the coding software we'll be looking at over the next three weeks, um, a bitbucket.org account, um, a git bash to talk to your bitbucket and your R, and then a terminal. But I'll go through all these a little bit more. So the first thing, um, for an R installation, uh, so you need to install R, and then R in Windows goes to that particular uh, link right there, but www.rproject.org has all of the R stuff, and actually, you know, I just realized we didn't share this with everybody, so we should probably do that first. So yeah. That way you guys can follow along and just click on the links and install it on the fly as we're doing this. Um, so let's see. So sharing this with everybody, we're going to have to so go one by one. not directly in our research group, could you just Mark give us Turner at, or MBT8 at case.edu? MBT8. Eight. All right. There you go. All right. Somebody Next. knows me. Well, maybe we'll start all the way there and just give me your case ID, which is the easiest one. Uh, SCS85. ZXL. ZXL. Yeah, to do zero. Okay, XM six six three. DXM sixty three. DXM. Okay. Okay. DXM sixty three. Six six. Oh. Six six. Yeah. That's you. Uh, six six three. Okay. Yes. Yes. DXO. DXO. He isn't tall. What? He isn't tall. Is how we can see everyone's name, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, YXZ 772. YXZ 772. Okay. CCB 55. Um, AXM 285. JXH 546. And also while we're doing this, if you want to go to rproject.org and start installing and downloading R, that'd be good to do. Um, uh, let's see, who's next over? Uh, CXC 724. CXC 
Everybody, okay. Sad. All right, so hopefully all 23 of the visitors here, and then that's like attendance too, at least for the first day. Um, so hopefully you all have that shared. If you want, you can go in there, you can click on it, then it'll just have the link so you can start kind of going there. Um, I'll kind of return and try to move slowly enough that you guys can get these things downloading get ready to install. Um, so again, uh, so the rproject.org, um, we'll uh, go to it real quick um, and check it out. Uh, so this is the R project for statistical computing. I believe it was started somewhere in the 70s, um, a statistics language. Um, and we tend to find it's very useful for us. Um, some interesting facts as you guys are downloading this is um, all of the version names uh, we found out, so Bug in Your Hair, Supposedly Educational, Very, Very Secure Dishes, all come from uh, Peanuts cartoons. So all those comic strips, if you Google uh, Supposedly Educational, you'll come up with a, um, uh, or Charlie Brown, or whatever it is, um, you'll, you'll find those things. So that's what they use as their naming scheme, which is kind of interesting. Um, so this will take you to a CRAN download. Um, and you would need to pick a mirror. Um, so case hosts. Uh, case has its own. Yeah. If we go down to the U.S. down here, we should be in here somewhere. Uh, case that view somewhere. Now there it is. Case Western. Click on that one uh, and download for whatever your operating system is. Um, download it. And open it, install it, um, and then uh, so moving from that. Then the next thing that we also use is R Studio, um, and R Studio is the integrated development environment, um, which we can see nice things and it makes more sense to us. Um, so you can uh, install that for free, um, put it on your desktop, and it works really nicely. And for those of you that can actually install this and all that, we'll go through some code that you can write as we go along and save it for yourself so you actually wrote out the commands and all that stuff. Um, so that's all the R pieces. Um, the next piece of what we're doing uh, is we like to use bitbucket.org as a site for um, repositories. Uh, if you sign up with an at.edu email, um, you get unlimited storage, I believe. Yeah. Unlimited private repositories. So this is like GitHub, right? It's, an, it's a competitor to GitHub, but it gives academic users free, private, unlimited private repositories. So in our group, we most probably have more than 100 repos that we share things with. Um, and so the, the purpose is to create those private repositories for you, and then versioning control um, on all of your repo repositories and your projects. Um, this is e exceptionally great for code, so you can roll back to different versions you have, you can check out what's been happening over time, um, look at all those different things. Also great for manuscripts when you made certain edits. 
um, and really anything else that you could think of that you'd like to be versioned and you don't want to sit there and put dash d1, dash d2, dash d3. Um, it will version things for you, um, which is great and it will continue to save them. Um, so we can actually go real quick to bitbucket.org. Um, so this is the STLE Bitbucket. Uh, has a lot of different projects in here. Um, has different commits of what uh, new things have been happening on here. Um, the basic overview on it. Uh, you don't have to get it right now, but in the future version, we hope that as we do the T times, we can utilize Git Bash, Bitbucket, and R all at the same time um, throughout the class to kind of get everybody moving. Um, uh, so Git Bash is something that's particular to Windows, Windows yeah. where it puts a little Linux environment and lets your Git server be there. On a Mac with exports installed, you already have a Linux environment for using Git, and if you run Linux, then you don't have to worry about anything. I'm quite partial to Linux, but we do everything for us platform that runs on all operating systems. Um, so uh, if you want it, it well, to download um, Git Bash, you can click on that link. Um, and so yes, it just connects your Bitbucket to your own machine, your local machine, or other machines that you want to use. Um, you can pull and push back and forth. Um, it's really useful to have. You can use it for other things as well, um, but that's what we primarily use it for um, our code and everything. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more just about R, uh, R in general. Um, the basic things uh, that we use R for. So uh, I have a quick little presentation here, but I also at the same time, for anyone who's able to have R open right now and are using it, um, if you want to download this file, T time class one, and then I put name, you can download it, put your own name in it, and we will run through all of the things in there. Um, in future versions, we'll actually make this a little bit more sophisticated, but that's for now. So I'll give some time for do that. So how many people in here, most of all the new people, use R at all? Some. How many people use R with Git for code versioning? And how many people use Markdown and R Markdown? Good, because for us, that three, that set of three things, and Python could be also thrown into the mix, is basically the avenue towards reproducible data science research and working with collaborators and sharing things openly. And so this introduction is going to be very basic, so if you have worked in R, we're not going to see anything new today, um, but we want to make sure that we hit all the bases for anybody that has not worked in R quite yet. Um, so if you just opened up the R that you downloaded, this is what would pop up. It's just the console, um, and all your R commands and everything works. Um, but what we like to use for the most is the IDE, or the Integrated Design or Development uh, Environment. And for R and R Studio, it usually comes up in four panels. You can play around with them how you wish. Um, uh, but the one panel here uh, has all your scripts that you're writing, what you're doing with them. Um, it also allows you to view certain data sets that you're interested in. Um, and there's some other things you can look at there. The console is where all your commands go. That's where you type in your functions, you, uh, whatever you want to do, enter, that in, enter them in and the code is run. Um, over here is uh, your environment, all the different values you have in there, uh, whether they're values or functions that you just created. Everything goes over there. You can qu quickly look at them. Um, and then over in the bottom right are uh, your files uh, for working directories you're currently in, the plots that you're creating, um, packages that you have on your computer, uh, all the help function or all the help files um, that you can look at, and then also a tab for viewer. Um, so to kind of get started, if you were able to. Um, so if you were able to open up the um, T time class underscore name, uh, we're going to kind of scroll through here and go over some of the things that um, are necessary to really use 
um, for R. So we always start our scripts up with a script name. So we put T time class one uh, dot R, the purpose for learning R, um, the authors, I authored it, uh, licenses, we use a license, Creative Commons attribution, not commercial, should I like national, and then channel log entries. Um, so this is going to, instead of being like a slideshow, I figured I'd write all of this down in code and comments, and we can kind of go along. Um, so, so script name, purpose, authors is essential. So if you write any code and you don't put your authors on it and you don't declare a license, then no one else can effectively use your code, right? I have to understand the license you put on it to make sure I can mix it with some GPL code GPL. or some Apache license code or some other things. In our group, we work on lots of different projects, doing lots of different analysis, and everyone in our group, we all share code back and forth, so we need to know, is it okay? Did Ethan put a very restrictive license that says, I'm the new Microsoft, you know, I don't want anyone to touch anything, if so, we'll just forget everything he does and leave him alone. But if you don't put that at all, you're effectively saying, I'm evil, I'm like Microsoft, and no one can use my code, okay? Because you don't want to pick up someone's code that they didn't declare a license on and then later on have them say, I made this a restrictive license. You know, that's exactly how open source software gets legally challenged. All right, so um, the first thing in R, um, a pound symbol or hashtag, if you don't know what a pound symbol is, uh, is the way that we comment, make comments in the script that aren't going to be executed. Um, so. Uh, I'm just going to go through very basically some of the different things. A uh, quick thing with R, control enter runs the line that you are currently on, at least in Windows it does. Um, so uh, in going through these things, you can quickly do it. Um, in the version that I put up on the Google Drive, not all of these things are filled out. So um, I deleted select lines and stuff so that way you can type them in yourself and run them and make sure that you know that they actually work, um, that they're working for you. Um, so hopefully as we go, I hear a lot of click, like uh, keyboarding and putting in stuff and making sure that these things are actually happening for you. Um, so the first thing is assigning numbers. The typical um, format and syntax is to put a uh, less than sign, um, dash, and then whatever you want to assign. So we could assign um, x uh, is equal to 5. And it'll pop up here in the values as x is 5. Um, and then we can also view that up here with the function view. So uh, the function view, capital V, I, E, W, um, parentheses, X, will let us view it. And it will pop up as something to be viewed in um, our top left window, um, right next to uh, wherever our script is. Right, um, and what we can also do is we can look into what view is as a function. This is a nice piece of R, and that makes it very useful um, to use, is that it has a pretty nice um, ability to check what functions are doing. So if we look at qu uh, question mark, view the function that we're interested in, over here in the bottom left, um, we will get uh, a help file. So this help file will say, all right, this is a function that invokes a data viewer, um, and it does it in a spreadsheet style. This is the usage, the different things you need to pass into it. Um, so I passed in a variable. Uh, you could also pass in a title that it would name um, this up here as something different if you wanted that. Um, some other details about it, um, and usually there's actually an example down here if it's a more uh, intricate function that you're looking at. So question mark, any function um, that you have on in R will work and show you all the different things and show you some examples as well. Um, so coming back to here, we can also assign it instead of just one number, uh, we can assign an array of numbers um, doing uh, x 1 to 5 will create a nice array for us uh, from 1 to 5 um, with five different places in there. Um, now we can also use equal sign instead of the less than dash sign. Um, I've been told that it's better to use the equal sign, but or better better to use the uh, less than dash, but I kind of get into the habit of using the equal sign, unfortunately. So there might be a lot of equals from here on out <laughs> as I'm uh, 
writing some of this. Um, and if I'm going too fast or anything, somebody let me know. Um, so then also we can assign character strings. So we were just doing numeric values um, and specific actually integers was the class. Uh, we can assign hello. So V equals quotations hello. Um, and this will now make it as uh, a character string. We can also use the print function to print to the console. So those two values that we already have in there, we can print V, uh, which then pops up in the console here, and it's hello. Or we can do print X, which prints that uh, vector or array of values 1 through 5. What's the advantage of putting print on the variable if you can just put the variable and it's going to write it? Oh, this one? Like just by writing V? Yeah. And it comes out. Um, so yeah, you can do that as well. Um, now, uh, if you call that variable and just put it in there, it'll print out. That's just the default for it. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I believe if you put it in a function, it may su it will suppress the B, whereas the print will actually print it when it's inside a loop or inside a function. Um, but in this case, you can just write in X and hit equal and enter it in, and it will pop right out. Also, we tend to use things like verbose uh, variable names and other things like that, so that other people reading your code will be quicker and faster to understand it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Printing. There are the shorthand, of, so that you can get away with doing this, but... Um, U was capitalized, print was not. Yeah. Our so, function. So that's just a, the syntax of whoever created the function first and then got it popular. Um, but yeah, so for V, now if we wrote in, um, in the console, if we put view x with a lowercase, it'll say, oh, we couldn't find that function, view. Um, uh, but if, then we know, okay, well, yeah, we gotta do a capital um, to get that to pop up. Okay. So yeah, it's just the, the function name itself. Um, so moving on from that, there's more, there's many more objects and types of classes within R. Uh, so we just looked at characters, integers, and there's also numeric, um, uh, I don't know, uh, complex, uh, logic, uh, true and false ones. So, uh, so if we look at some of these kind of vectors and go through, make a couple of these up, um, we can make a vector of two characters, um, hello and uh, mispronounced, misspelled world. So we'll fix that. Hello world, um, and that now that's a uh, character vector with two different characters in it. We can also then make another one that looks to have uh, high as a character and then five as a number or an integer. Um, but if we look over in our environment after running that, we find that they're both actually characters, um, and the reason why is R interprets itself what the um, most common one is in there for that uh, high cannot be a number, but five can be a character. So it will assign all of those variables as characters. Um, we move on to the last one, uh, which I think I left in everybody's because it was a little bit tedious to write out all those just random numbers. Um, th that one will now be a number, one to three array of 1.23, 2.14, and all those. Um, we can also say that, um, oh, and one quick note there is that I was using C and putting in parentheses everything in there. C is concatenate, so it will combine the values that you want to put together. You put C, all of those, it puts them all in as one um, uh, vector or array. Uh, the last one here is a uh, logic, so I thought it would be fun to put false equals true, and so it comes up in there, and that is a logic class. Um, so again, these will have uh, attributes such as dimensions, what the actual object class is, lengths, widths. Um, so we can go through and check the attributes. Uh, this is actually a really major thing whenever you're debugging. Uh, it's always really good to check what are your classes um, in your data frames and your data sets, um, because if you're trying to run an operation that is numeric on a character class, you'll end up with a bunch of NAs. Um, so really using the function class to check classes is actually very, very useful. Um, uh, 
really helps debug. So if we check the class A, it'll come back as a character. Um, we can see that over in the environment, um, but if we are looking at something that's much more massive and we can't directly see it, using this function will allow us to check it real quick. Um, we can look at the next class, also character. Like I said before, because of high being in there, a character string next to uh, integer, it's going to go to the character class. Uh, if we look at x, it'll tell us integer, because they're all perfect whole numbers there. Um, and if we look at c, it'll tell us it's numeric. And finally, false is logical. And then if you just uh, looked at false, it's true. So I'm not uh, um, There's also a couple other objects. One are factors. Um, factors are for categorizing things. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a later class because they're a little bit more complex um, and interesting. And also lists, which are probably the most dynamic piece of R, uh, is that lists are really, really big things that you can save all different characters inside of it um, and kind of places them really nicely. Uh, but we'll talk about that. Um, so now we can also change classes, and there's a lot of uh, useful functions to change classes. For example, we just made C, which was the um, numeric array over here. And we can take C and we can turn it into a character. So as that character of C, we'll turn C into a character. So there it is, we look at the class, uh, it is a character. Um, so there's a lot of very useful um, functions in R to change all of your uh, class types to other class types very quickly by just using one function. Um, other ones are uh, as.numeric, as.integer, um, as.posixct, which is a date format. We'll I'll get into that in another class because uh, date formats are actually pretty tough and tricky um, and a lot of bad things can happen with them. Uh, but everybody has <coughs> working with any time series data of any sort, you're going to have a timestamp, and you're going to have to make sure that you have the right date formatted. Um, uh, as dot factor, as dot list. So, when you change uh, factor to as numeric, as dot numeric, you know, you always do something wrong. Yeah. So we have to do as factor, as numeric. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Factors are really kind of funny. Um, I don't know if I completely understand them, but I know how to use them. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, actually with factors, um, so factor says that it saw, so if you read in, say, a data set that had timestamps, it will look at every individual timestamp and say that that is a categorical variable, and that particular timestamp is one category, and the next one's another category. Um, so, and then it labels them as levels. So if you had 90 rows, it'd say you have 90 levels in there. Um, so it takes all those and they can be numbers, they can be weird things. Um, I think there's more extent to just things that look like characters um, in there. But yes, if you take them from factors and then as that character, as that numeric, that's how you're able to take it down those levels. Um, it doesn't read very well from as that character, fa from factor to numeric, as go factor to character to numeric. Not really sure why, but <laughs> I've noticed that as well. Uh, also, uh, data frames, which are the I think one of the most nicest things in R, um, a very useful object that you can use in almost everything that you're doing. Um, the nice thing with them is that the columns, individual columns that you have um, in your data frame, can be different classes. Um, all right, moving onward. Uh, we can also check the lengths. Yeah. So, what there are objects? So there are different. Yeah, so on the objects, <laughs> what we do is that we live with class 3 objects only because class 4 objects and class 3 objects are not compatible. And so we live in a world where we just stay with class 3 objects. This is the same as the choice in Python between Python 2.7 and Python 3. And most everyone lives in the Python 2.7 so far. And some people use Python. So we keep it, all the object work we do as in the class three objects. I haven't found any reason, any unique advantage to the class four ones. What is the difference? 
Uh, it's mostly question. just that they made a choice that's not backwards compatible. <laughs> so therefore, we'll all stay where we have a lot of code that already works, and we haven't found a reason to go forward. Yeah, I used Fido C for that package here, mm -hmm. and sometimes some packages they have like two different mm -hmm. packages, and then they have to be classed, and sometimes they have an S4 class. Yeah. Yeah, and what we've been able to do so far in that problem is just stay with one version. It's like one of these hidden problems that we would have to choose to quite consciously migrate to the newer version. <coughs> um, so moving on, this is kind of redundant to hit length over and over again, but we can check the length of the different variables that we have. Um, there they all are, 2, 2, 5, 3, and 1. Um, I'll just kind of skip over that. But length is a function that will return uh, whatever the dimensions, uh, the primary dimension of that array is or vector. Um, when we look at data, uh, data frames, it gets a little bit different. Um, so there's, others, there's some other nice functions to create objects, uh, one of them being sequence, matrix, vector, array. Um, uh, one right here is sequence. Um, so running through sequence, you can say that you want to sequence through 1 to 24 by equals 3. So it will make a, um, if I look at it, um, it will give us 1, 4, 7, 10, 13, and so on. Um, won't include 24 because it's not, uh, it won't include that because uh, it goes to 25. Um, so sequence is nice to use for um, uh, when you're just making some array that goes at a very select interval. Um, what you'll also notice, um, and I'm not sure if I wrote this in there or not, but as you write in, uh, say, n equals sequence, and you do this and start writing in 1 to 24, usually, I guess not on here, but a lot of different options will pop up to tell you how to do the function. Um, so R will dynamically let you know what your options are in using particular functions. Um, it should pop up with by equals and ask you to put in some type of number. Help define what parameters it's expecting to see and things like that. Those are all under the tools, mobile options, turn on. So. Yeah. So if we even just looked at sequence. Um, it would tell us the description and all the different things that we could do inside. Um, another is matrix. So we can make a matrix. We'll call it N. Um, what I'm doing here is saying that it's going to be a matrix of zeros uh, with three rows and three columns. And I'll print that real quick. And there it is in the console. Sitting there, three rows, three columns, nine values, all of zeros. Um, we can look at those dimensions, and it will return to us three and three. The first one, the first three, is going to be the rows of the matrix, and the second uh, number three will be the columns of the matrix. Um, now, we the syntax for looking into matrix, because we were using vectors previously the entire time we were doing this, um, once you get into, uh, and actually I should mention that um, for M, say we want to know what the third value is. You use brackets, uh, square brackets, and you put in the value you want to know. You want to know the second space inside the vector, uh, and that was four. So that's how you go into um, your data. Uh, so looking at the matrix, um, if we want to look at the second row, second column, and call it 2, we will do that, call it, print it back out, and now um, the middle value has been changed to 2. Right. Um, we can be even more efficient, though, if we know that all of one column is the same value, um, or the um, opposite, we know all of a row is the same value. So we can say n and leave the row, uh, the row space blank, and then fill in what column we want. This lets, it, lets, this lets R know that, hey, we want all of column 1 to equal 3. So we say all of 1, 3, print it out. Now all of the column 1 is 3s. Um, and then we have our other values that were still there. Wait, wait, uh, sorry. Can you go back in that last one? Yeah, this one? Yeah. Uh, which piece? Yeah, just the changing all the first column to what, what did you do? OK, so, um, so when we look at this syntax with the square brackets, the first value is the rows, and the second value is the columns. If we leave the rows blank, 
Mm -hmm. R will say, we're going to do every single row that exists, and we'll yeah. just go down that entire column. Um, so we'll say n, all rows, 1, and then we're going to say equals 3. Um, and by doing that, it uh, assigns all of column 1 to 3, then just printing it to look at what it is. Um, now we could also say that n, um, 1, equals 2.2. So this would say that all of row 1, um, which includes all of the columns, will now be 2.2. And if we print that, um, all of row 1 will now be 2.2. It's just the, the quick, easy way to do it, um, uh, especially if you want to change an entire column to another class. Mm -hmm. You'd like to identify that column and all the rows change to a new class. Um, moving forward, we can now change this matrix into a data frame. Uh, which I was mentioning before, is a very useful piece of R, and this allows for multiple classes to be in one object. Um, so if we do that, and, or as.data.frame of the matrix we just made, n, um, that. so now if we look over here, it has now changed it from a value into data. So R, think, R tends to think that um, any data that we are looking at has um, multiple classes inside of it that we need to pay attention to. We can open that up and look what it is, and it'll tell us that the first uh, the first column is are these values and their number class. The second column, this that. Uh, we can also view and see what it looks like. Uh, so these are the three columns that we have and all the values inside of them. Um, now, right now, if we looked at the matrix before we turned to a data frame, it wouldn't look much different. Um, but what is very different is now we can change individual rows in there. So if we say that the first row, second column, equals the string character, um, not the function character, but just throw that in there. Um, and then we'll say that the entire third row is going to be true, the logical. We can print that out and we can see that we have character now in there and trues. And then these are still all um, numbers over here. And we can ask, what is the class of the data frame? And it will tell us, well, it's a data frame, which makes sense. Um, but now we can individually ask all the different columns inside of the data frame, what are you? So. If we ask for the first column, it will tell us it's a numeric class. Um, if we look at the second column, it will tell us it's a character. And the third column will be logical values. Um, so this is very useful for when you're looking at data where you have a timestamp. So the very first column is going to be a date class that you have to define. And then your second column could be numeric. Um, or your third column could be a category or factor, factor say, day of the week. Um, and you can combine all of those. So you change only one uh, row and one in that column only one set. So yeah. it is giving everything as character. So does it change everything in character? Or yes. Or is it just a numerical or So it will look at the entire column and decide which one it needs to be. So um, that entire column has to be the same class. So it looks at those three variables, which I think were character, then two and zero. And it says, well, character can't be a number. Two and zero are a number, so we have to be a character because two and zero can be a character. Um, so it will go to the, the most um, usable, uh, most generic class that it can per column. Um, so as soon as we have changed any, any character, both columns will become yeah. the whole column. Now, if I threw a number in a random space in there that isn't the character, it will still stay as a character because the character is still in that column. Um, I think character is the most basic one that it will always go down to. Um, I'm not sure what the what everything is in terms of the hierarchy, but character is the base. And so the big thing is just check your class. The standard thing that goes wrong, you had what you thought was a nice sensible data frame, you have lots of different classes and all your different columns, and then all of a sudden your plots all come out screwed up. It's all fine because the values in a certain column you're trying to plot have fixed classes, and it makes it a problem. Yeah. So for an example, um, in R, 
uh, time stamps, you can make it a POSIX CT class. And it's a very nice class to plot. It will put on the bottom a couple tick points of the dates and the times, um, make it not very cluttered, looks really nice. But if you don't convert it to a date time, um, if you left it, say, a factor or a character, it will plot every single character string on the x-axis. And usually what it does is it gives you an error and says that after it's spent like five minutes trying to do it, it'll say there's way too much going on here, you need to change something. Um, so that's uh, um, the nice thing with changing the class. Question? Yeah. Um, sorry, this maybe is a very stupid thing, but what's the difference between having a matrix and having a data frame? Why would you want to change something to a data frame? Oh, so we, we all live in data frames all the time because they allow you to have all your predictors, all your variables uh -huh. as columns, and they can all be different classes. So it's a very flexible format. A matrix would be more something used for doing image processing. But you just have a whole bunch of pixel values, X and Y, and, and it's all the same structure. So let's say a matrix can be would be all numbers. Or so if it's all on, words yeah, or if whatever. you're doing a study of uh, people living in a city, you can have their age and their driver's license and their gender and their. So that would be a data frame. So that's a data frame. Right. And then all the observations are rows. So all the variables in your multivariate analytics are columns. All the observations are rows. So p across and down. You can spend your whole life in data frames. It's very okay. nice. So, Thanks. so I just made. And so that's like in Python, pandas is the data frame structure that Python uses. Uh, so I just made a new matrix, which is a character matrix that has all these values I uh, just randomly threw in things. But it can only be a character, and it can't change any of the columns or the rows to any other class. Um, so a data frame is just much more malleable and nice to use. Um, so let's see. I see that we're at about four fifteen. Um, I can continue yeah. with some of this, or we'll just... I think we just cut wait for tomorrow. Yeah. I think right. the idea is let's just make this a little kind of strict thing. Yeah. Right. So we will continue with uh, the next speech tomorrow. Uh, if, I, I think that it really is the best way to get into R is if, if you can bring a laptop and just type these out yeah. so you can see the errors as they pop up and ask the questions. Um, we'd rather everybody get a good understanding of, oh, I want to make an array of five uh, numbers sequenced by a certain thing, I know how to do it, and it won't be a barrier to you uh, going, going after. It's always best to see someone else's console and see that no one can type well, and everyone makes mistakes. Yeah. It's ever <laughs> much more comfortable, yeah. you know. I went to write the first one right there, <laughs> matrix, I left out the I. <laughs> Sound good? Any questions or thoughts? Hopefully this is interesting to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.